Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. So today guys, I wanted to share with you something that I hope is going to be helpful, is going to be a blessing for you. Uh, it's going to be a little Bible study uh, about a very famous passage that we find in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says that the we must worship God, or the Father, in spirit and truth. And uh, you're going to hear a lot of people preaching and teaching about this verse, and you're going to uh, you're going to hear different interpretations about this passage. Now, the purpose of this video is just to give you the tools that then you have to use, you have to get better at by reading scriptures, by trying to understand the context, by trying to improve your skills in understanding historically what, go what was going on, right? So in the time of Jesus, what was the uh, relationship, for example, between the Samaritans and the Jews. What had happened in the past that had caused these bad relationships between them? And uh, in this context, so the what happens, well, so what is Jesus talking about earlier? What is the, in this case, this Samaritan woman that Jesus is talking with? What she's she talking about? So what is going on? And in this way, you're going to be seeing that it's much easier to understand appropriately what Jesus is talking about and, uh, and therefore escaping the danger that I unfortunately I find that today it's present in a lot of different churches especially like the most Pentecostal or charismatic or progressive churches uh, where uh, many many verses are interpreted as if they stand by themselves and they're not put in a certain context now don't get me wrong there are certain passages of scriptures that I just start from finish and it's just it. Like you don't really need to go that much broader in, in context. But there are other passages that you need context. You need to understand what is going on. What are the people involved talking about? Because if we really think and we really believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then we should approach it seriously. And we should really put effort into trying to understand properly what is going on, what the Bible, what God is trying to reveal to us through the written word. And I'm going to give you as an example this passage in John chapter 4. Uh, so I hope, again, this is going to be a blessing and something helpful for you. Uh, and uh, let's dive in. So uh, the passage that I'm talking about is in verses 23 and 24. But as I said before, we need to go earlier and we need to look at the context to understand the um, better what Jesus is talking about. So in that way, we're not going to be giving some um, not entirely accurate interpretation of this passage about worship. So um, this is the this is going to be the purpose of this video. I'm going to try to show you the, the line of thinking. Remember, we always should use our mind when we're re reading scriptures. We should be humble. We should ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us to understand, but we also need to do our part. We need to use our skills, trying to reason about scriptures and trying to understand what is going on. So it's a mix of the two, right? And I recommend you to read the whole chapter, chapter four of the Gospel of John, to read it from verse one so you understand more what's going on. Again, I'm going to summarize. In this particular um, passage, in this particular scene, all right, where the woman and Jesus are talking at Jacob's well, Jesus is at a city of Samaria called Sychar. And, um, and this was a place in that part of the land, that part of Israel, that in the past had belonged to the 12 tribes. So I'm going to show you here a map. This was a map of the 12 tribes when they conquered the promised land, when they conquered, when they had the, the, the place that God had prepared uh, for them. So this was after... Uh, Moses and the Israelites leave Egypt, right? Egypt is down here. They leave Egypt and then they enter into the promised land. And this is how the different tribes distributed and had the different uh, land, all right? And you can see that the uh, the part where then Samaria was is pretty much right here, here. This is the region, the part that then became Samaria. So what happened? Well, it happened that after King David, so we're going forward after Joshua, right, the 12 tribes, then we'll go to the judges' time, and uh, we get to King David, then we get to his sons, then after Solomon, the, the different sons of Solomon started having trouble. They started having, um, like, they started fighting among one another. So that's when they created these two different kingdoms, 
the kingdom of Judah on the southern or the southern kingdom, and then the kingdom of Israel in the in the uh, northern side. Each of them had a capital. Each of them had a lineage of kings. You can find all this in books in the Old Testament called uh, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. You can find a lot more detail about this, what's going on, and uh, and because of their iniquity, because of their evil, because they went astray from God's word, from his commandments. They started worshiping false gods. They started going uh, after false gods, like sacrificing their children, uh, building high places, uh, and doing a lot of evil things that were really blasphemous to God. He was angry at them and he punished them. And he judged them by allowing other nations to conquer them, to deport them into other uh, into other sites, for example, the captivity in Babylon, right? And then they went when brought back into the land afterwards. And uh, what happened is that this particular region right here, there was a city called Samaria. This became, then we go back, we go forward, right, to the time of Jesus. This became as known as Samaria, this region right here. And remember, it was of the Israelites. It was an old part where Israelites were. Now, after the uh, captivity and when they went back to the place, uh, what happened is that many of the Israelites started to marry with foreign people. They started to marry with uh, Babylonians or with people coming from other nations that weren't Israelites. And so they started to contaminate themselves, not only because they couldn't keep the lineage, but also because they started adopting all these customs and they kept worshiping all these idols and uh, all these false practices. They abandoned God's commandments, God's decrees. And, uh, and because of this, what happened is that between the kingdom of Judah, right, that was the one in the bottom, and the kingdom, in this case, it's Samaria, right, these two regions, the Jews, so the ones coming from Judea, and the Samaritans, they had these bad relationships, because the Jews, because of how they had intermarried and contaminated themselves, they didn't consider them to be brothers anymore. So it's like, no, I, I don't, I, we don't consider you anymore as our brothers and sisters, even though, remember, they were. So this is the this is the situation, right? And you can see that here, this actually the city where Jesus was, Sikar, close to Mount uh, Gerizim, which is a mountain where Jacob, I think, had encountered with God. So um, you can see that Jesus many times he went from Judea to Galilee, and uh, sometimes he went through Samaria, sometimes he went like this, on going from the Decapolis, going around, and. Uh, in this particular passage, if we go back to John chapter 4, you can see that Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee with his disciples. But he needed to go through Samaria, and you can see why, right? Jesus was right here in Judea and needed to go to Galilee, which is up here. And so he decided to go through Samaria. Many times the Jews decided to go like this in the other way around just to have, have, have not to deal with the Samaritans. Or like going through this places, like very far away from cities, trying not to meet anyone so that they couldn't have any issues, any, any, anything to deal with them. Now, this is the context, all right? I just wanted to give you some because this is going to be important. Um, and uh, now Jesus starts talking with this woman. And then after we go to the, to the last part of the uh, story, the woman understands that Jesus is a prophet because of the fact that Jesus reveals to her that he knows about her, about her life, who she is, that she has no husband, that she had five husbands, that she's living now with a, a man that's not her husband. And so uh, she understands that, yes, you're a prophet. And now from verse 20, this is the very important part because this word is linked to verses 23 and 24. And this is critical to our understanding of what Jesus is talking about when he says that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So the woman, reading from verse 20, says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Now, when she's talking about our fathers, she's talking about Jacob, right? She's talking about Isaac, she's talking about Abraham. She's talking about their uh, forefathers because of the fact that the Samaritans, even though they intermarried and they kind of mixed with the, with the nations that, that then were brought there, but uh, they still were descendants of Jacob. They were still kind of Israelites. So she's saying, our fathers worship on this mountain. And the mountain she's referring to is Mount Gerizim, right here. They were, it's close to Sikar, see? 
And then she says, but you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. So she's asking Jesus as if she's kind of putting him to a test. You're a prophet. So if you're a prophet, tell me this, answer me this, which is the correct location where we should worship? Right? This is the question of the woman. Location. Where? Where should we worship? Remember, this is important. The where. So the woman, the woman asks about where. And Jesus replies, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And it's interesting, right? Because Jesus replies to her, the where of the worship is wrong in both cases. So there is a time that is coming where worship will not be done in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. This is very interesting, right? And then Jesus continues, and again, verse 22, she, he says, you, so here is referring to Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. We, Jews, know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And now in verse 22, Jesus is addressing the how, the knowledge. So the Samaritans, because of all this intermarrying, because of all this adopting false practices, worshiping false idols, false gods, um, adopting false customs and practices, they had strayed so much from the worship of the Lord that they were worshiping not in the true way. Like they were worshiping in a, in, in a wrong way, in a sense. And that's why Jesus says that you worship what you do not know. And probably they also had false uh, beliefs about the Messiah or about the Christ. And uh, so that's why he says, you do not know what you worship. Instead, the Jews, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus is saying, at least the Jews, the ones from the kingdom of Judah, they had kept the decrees of God. They hadn't strayed so much like you Samaritans did from the, from the decrees and commandments of God. So they had kept and they had a true worship. So in the sense that they had knowledge, they were worshiping God appropriately. They, were, they knew what, were, what they were doing, in a sense. And, uh, and they know that the Messiah must come from the lineage of David, from the kingdom of Judah, right? So salvation is of the Jews. This is where the Messiah will come from. And I want to, again, to make you pay attention. Jesus here is talking about the where, the place of worship, so where, and also the how, right? In the second part. So it's very important that you worship the place of worship and how you worship. So where and how. And that's when Jesus in verse 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. So you see now what it means? Jesus is answering to the where and to the how. Jesus is answering saying true worshipers because I am here, I am the Messiah. So the hour is now, it has arrived. True worshipers will worship the Father where? In spirit. How? In truth. See how Jesus just replies and uh, uh, makes the woman understand what she's asking about, right? What she, her doubts, her false beliefs about the place and the method of worship, Jesus is answering both. She's saying, look, the worship, the word of worship is in spirit. It doesn't matter the location. It doesn't matter if it's on this mountain. It doesn't matter if it's in Jerusalem. It doesn't matter if it's in the temple. It doesn't matter. True worship is in spirit. That means that it's a heart attitude. It's not really, it's not only, right, we have to say, bringing the sacrifices, the offerings, performing certain rituals, certain ceremonial laws. It's not only about that, but it's more. It's more than going to a place or doing certain things. It's done in the spirit, in your heart. It's the heart attitude. Why you're worshiping God. And this is something that can be done anywhere. So here Jesus replies the first a question of the woman, the were. The were is in spirit, anywhere, because God is spirit. So God himself is not bound to a certain location, to Jerusalem, to the temple, or to the mountain, or to whatever else. God is spirit, so God is everywhere. So you can worship him anywhere. You're not bounded by that. And then Jesus replies the how. How we must worship God? In truth. And that's also the problem of the, in this case, the Samaritans, that they were worshiping God, but not in truth. They didn't even know what they were really worshiping because they had adopted, they had all these false beliefs 
about not only the Messiah, but about actually worshiping God, they had strayed so much from God's word that they were not worshiping in truth. They didn't know what they were doing. And that's why Jesus says that true worshipers will worship how? In truth. So understanding well who God is, getting it right, right? Having the correct understanding and knowledge of God, of who God is, of his character. And, uh, uh, and so the act of devotion and the act of submission, and the act of reverence towards God. And, uh, and that's it. So you can see here how if we just take a look at the context, what was going on, and uh, uh, we pay attention to the interaction between the woman and Jesus, we can see that Jesus here is answering, is not revealing to us um, like the fact that worship is like we must enter into kind of this spiritual reality or this spiritual realm. And that's only when we can truly worship God and we can like get to know him. He can reveal himself to us. And we can see him moving or revivals or miracles, wonders. Amen. If that happens, amen. You no, know, God is great. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he pleases and uh, it's all for his glory. But this is not like a prescriptive way in which we must worship. So in this spiritual way, right? But Jesus is just answering the where and the how. Where, true worshipers, where will we worship the Father? In spirit, anywhere. They're not bounded by a place. How? In truth. So having the correct, the true beliefs about God and worshiping him in truth and knowing what they're doing. Uh, and that's it. So I hope this was helpful for you. I have a lot of other verses that I could read uh, more. For example, you can see in 2 Kings chapter 17, uh, from verse 24 onwards, you can see exactly what happened after some of the Israelites were brought back with other people. They were brought back to that part of the land and how they adopted uh, these false practices, right? When they worship the Lord, but at the same time, they serve their own gods. They had these false practices. They had these shrines in the high places. Uh, and so at the end of the day, they neither worship the Lord because they did not did their key adhere also to the decrees and regulations. So they just strayed so much. They intermarried. And, uh, and that's why even to this day, uh, they they continue to do this, and um, they that's that, that was the issue, right? That's why Jesus says you worship what you do not know, because you had adopted these bad practices, these false beliefs about God. And now, if you go to the Greek in John chapter four, uh, I recommend you to if you do not have BibleHub.com, you go to Interlinear, you can find the Greek text and then word by word translation. Again, you can check a bit more about the word, for example, for worshiping, right? This proskuneo is one of the is one of the main words used for the act of worship. Literally, it means kissing the feet, like kissing the ground towards, like it's the act that you do when you bow down and you uh, kiss the ground when you prostrate. So that is the uh, literal way, the literal translation. And again, it's just the act of reverence that you show to God uh, and... Um, and you can find uh, more details, right? If you go here, you can find also about the word, for example, for spirit, which is pneuma. And again, this word is used both for the human spirit, both for the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so uh, depending on the context, you can see what is uh, talking about. And, uh, and then again, for the word for truth, many very, very present. And uh, truth, remember, means corresponding to reality. So when you say something that is true, it means it corresponds to reality, uh, corresponds to the fact. So this is the, the Greek word, you know, and associated with what Jesus is talking about. And, uh, and now I have uh, some more verses here that I want to very quickly share with you that speak a little bit more and help us to understand that worship is not only uh, an act, like a spiritual act that we do. Right? Remember, true worship, if it's done, as Jesus said, in spirit, meaning anywhere with the intention of the heart, having reverence for God, and then in truth, so having the correct and the true beliefs about God and knowing who he is, then that means that it's not only something about uh, spiritual, but it's something that we do with all our being. Our mind must worship God. Our heart must worship God. Our spirit must worship God. Our bodies must worship God. And also our actions must also worship God. So we always must have this attitude that whatever we do, we do it for God's glory. We do it to please the Lord, to 
uh, honor him. And yes, we messed up. We uh, don't deny ourselves. We don't take up our cross. We follow our thoughts, our desires. But this is the reality, you know, of the human fallenness. The fact that we're still in this body affected by sin, even after we have come to the knowledge of the truth, we have come to know Christ, we have been created, we have, a, uh, we have been made a new creation by the Holy Spirit, but still in our walk with the Spirit, we still have the temptations, the struggles against the flesh. And uh, it's fine. And it's something that, you know, happens. And that's what we need, God. We don't become perfect, right? But we still always need God. We need him to forgive us. We need him to help us, to guide us. And we need to keep every day taking up our cross, denying ourselves and following Jesus. And but as I said before, it's worship, true worship is something that we do because of the intentions of our heart and it's something that we do with all our being. And uh, just an example here, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. So it's not one or the other, right? but it's both. I will sing, I will pray with the spirit, so spiritually, but we also pray with the understanding, with the mind. So knowing what I'm doing, I'm not like losing control of myself or not doing something, not knowing what I'm doing. You are going to never see in the Bible an episode where God like kind of possesses someone and that particular someone is forced to do something against their will or involuntarily. You're never going to find anything like that. God is always working through us, with us. So we have to have the willingness to uh, follow him and to let him guide us. He will not force us into uh, what he wants to accomplish, into his purpose. We need to follow him. And for this, it's needed our mind, our will. It's involved. Now, Hebrews 13, for example, says, Therefore, by him, so by Jesus, by the Son, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, the sacrifice sacrifices were very much linked to the idea of worship because in the old testament the ways in which the ceremonial laws and all the different decrees and commandments that god has given was also to worship him through the offerings through the sacrifices so this was another way in which in this case is a sacrifice of praise right so is our lips exalting god uh, as the psalm says you know my i i said to my soul Bless the Lord. You know, so my soul blesses the Lord. And I'm thankful for him. I exalt him. I declare his glory, his goodness, his power, uh, his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his love. So I declare all these things and I'm just thankful for him, for his salvation, for how, for his promises, for what he has done through Christ, uh, for, you know, how, for his revelation to my life to my family, to whatever I've been able to accomplish for his call, for his purpose. All these things make us being thankful to God and praise him and worship him. This is a, an attitude of worship. Remember, the heart is very important, the intention, why you're doing it. But then verse 16, very importantly, says, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So it's interesting to say here that actually, Sacrifice of praise is one type of sacrifice, but there are other types of sacrifices. Sacrifices such as doing good, sharing, helping others, showing compassion, showing God's love, mercy, forgiving. All these things are sacrifices with which God is, is well pleased. So these are different ways, as you can see here, where we can worship God with our attitudes, with our words, with our behavior. So this is you can see that worship is not just merely an act that we do, right? When we just, uh, I don't know, close our eyes and we uh, worship God. That, that is one way in which we can worship, but there are many ways in which we can worship. So, and again, music, as you can see here, is not always involved. Uh, praising, like as it's known today, you know, worship is almost always associated with music nowadays. But that's not the, 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 biblically, that's not the only way or necessarily the only way in which we can worship. We can worship even when we do something like a service to a fellow brother, brother uh, or we help uh, a sister. These are all things that when done with the correct attitude to honor God, to please God, these are things that are worship because we're worshiping God. 
and uh, and it's awesome, right? And lastly, Romans 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, uh, reasonable service. So again, this is a reasonable thing that we do, right? In the in the Greek is logikos. So again, it's something that we do involves our minds. It's something that we do voluntarily and that we understand what we're doing, right? Service is another word uh, for uh, worship as well. And again, in this case, is our bodies. So um, struggling or putting the effort to keep our bodies healthy, take care of our bodies, uh, presenting our bodies as instruments of righteousness. So presenting them holy, not being contaminated with the things of the world, being acceptable to God, all these things with our bodies, right? With each normally, it's something that we uh, think to uh, think the less, right? Because of the fact that it's just a body that's corruptible, that's going to eventually grow weary, it's going to eventually die. And we're awaiting, we're hoping for our heavenly and perfect eternal bodies that we're going to have. Uh, but even though that is the reality, but we still have to take care of our bodies. We still can use our bodies as a way to worship God. And uh, again, because it's a living sacrifice. It's very, very interesting how the Bible really allows us to understand that the worship is with all our being, with our bodies, with our spirit, with our soul, with our heart, with our mind. Everything is involved in worshiping God. Remember, in spirit, with the intention of the heart, it can be done anywhere. You're not anymore bounded to a location. And in truth, so having the correct, true beliefs about God and uh, uh, who he is and what he has done. I have also more here verses about truth in this case. Um, and I'm going to just go through them very quickly. Psalm 119, 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Uh, Proverbs 35, 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. And then there is a, a warning. It says, Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. So as I said before, uh, at the beginning, we have to be careful not to add, not to give more meaning to what the Word of God is saying, because this is something that is not pleasing God, is not honoring God, and uh, we might stray from the truth, um, and uh, we have to take the Word of God seriously. So uh, understanding them appropriately in context for what they are truly um, meaning. John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 16, 13, 15, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And as I said before, this so, like chapter 16 of John, especially the first uh, like part, it's so important because it tells us really about the work of the comforter, of the helper, so the Holy Spirit, and how he is a key factor in the life of a believer, in how maybe an unbeliever is drawn to God, and he's convicted of sin, he's convicted of righteousness, he's convicted of judgment, and we need the Holy Spirit because he is the one that will guide us into all truth. We need the Holy Spirit guidance to understand scriptures, to understand them properly, to understand what there was going on so that we don't fall astray and we don't start believing false things about God. Otherwise, we, as the Samaritans, we have the danger of starting to worship God in spirit, but not in truth. And at the same time, it's very important that we don't worship the Father in truth, but not in spirit. So it's very important that both of them are together at the same time. Another one, John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You can see how Jesus says about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, the Psalm saying the entirety of the word is truth. 
here John, John 17, 17 saying, your word, Father, your word is truth. John 16 saying that whatever the Father has, it's also mine. And the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. He will, he will reveal to you what, uh, what he sees, what he hears. Uh, you can see how everything is connected, right? How Jesus is the truth, God is truth, the spirit of truth, the word is truth. Jesus is the logos, you know, the eternal logos. Um, and you can see how at the end of the day, truth is such an, a key part of Christianity. And that's why it's so important that we worship in spirit and in truth. Um, and then I have some more verses in, um, in the New Testament. For example, Ephesians 1.13 that says, In him, so in Christ, you also trusted. Oops. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So this is the regeneration, this is the new birth, um, the new creation that happens after we put our faith in Christ. So after we believe in Christ, we receive him. That's when we, uh, the Holy Spirit changes us, transforms us, takes away the heart of stone and puts a heart of flesh, and that we're born again. Um, and that we, uh, we belong, the Holy Spirit starts to dwelling in us. And he seals us for the promise of the inheritance that we're going to have in Christ, the eternal inheritance, eternal blessings. And then also 2 Timothy 2.15 that says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's also a passage, I think, in Ephesians chapter 6, when he's talking about the armor of God, that says, put on the belt of truth. And it seems uh, like unless you really dive again deeply into the historical context, how the armor was made of the Romans, and you understood that the belt is something very important because the belt is carrying your weapon and the belt is connecting the upper armor with the bottom part of the armor. So if the belt had any issues or was loose or whatever, you could lose to lose your weapon and you could just have your armor being all loose and therefore being uh, very vulnerable to arrows or to be damaged or to be um, injured by the enemy. So the belt of truth is so important. So truth is such a central aspect in Christianity, as I was able to show you, because it's the fact that it's the thing that ties everything together. It keeps, it allows you to use your weapon, which is the word of the spirit, appropriately, and then it keeps the breast, breast of righteousness, it keeps the bottom part of the legs, right, the feet of the speed of the gospel, and the shield of faith, like everything is held that tied together thanks to the belt of truth. Uh, and again, I just, uh, I just re uh, remember about that, and I just wanted to share it. I don't have the verse here, but it's in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul describes the armor of the, uh, it says, put on the full armor of God, so that you might stand in days of evil, um, and uh, resist, you know, the uh, machineries of the of the devil. And uh, that's it, guys. So I hope that this was helpful, as I said before, for you, gave you a different perspective about what Jesus is meaning in uh, this passage, and uh, that this allow you to think, you know, a little bit more. And remember, my main goal with these videos is to um, make you use critical thinking and the remember that it's important that we take the Bible seriously. We study it seriously, we study it appropriately, um, and we don't just go random and we just uh, put whatever meaning we think the verses have, but we really try to understand the verses and their meaning in context, uh, because it's a, it's a word of God. So we should be highly um, valuing it highly. And I hope you enjoyed. God bless you and see you. Bye-bye.